Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 109. In this episode, I interview Barely Growin. She has been gardening for two and a half years and grows a variety of plants such as comfrey, fruit trees, medicinal plants, and more. Today we're going to get into outdoor gardening tips and tricks for success. If you want to see highlights of these podcast episodes, search Garden Talk Clips on YouTube. That is a channel dedicated to short clips of these podcast episodes. I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to provide free information about gardening all plants to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. Their Grow 10 kits are incredible. You get their Ion Board LED grow light, their Grow Tent, which is currently the thickest on the market, their ventilation system, clip-on fan, and their Controller 69 to control it all. You also get their fabric pots, trellis net, plant ties, and trimmers. Definitely a good price for all that you get in the kit. I'll have a link in the description section below so you can learn more about these Grow Tank kits and the discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Barely Growing. How are you doing today? I'm doing so well, Chris. Thank you for having me on. Oh, thanks for coming on. Today we're going to get into outdoor gardening, tips and tricks for success. So I've had a few people request more outdoor gardening. I'm mostly an indoor gardener, so I prefer, you know, I mostly focus on that. But I do have a small outdoor garden where I grow vegetables. But before we get too deep into outdoor gardening, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Yeah, I'd love to. My name is Cassie. I'm going to be 29 this year. I live out in Oklahoma, and I own my little farmhouse and three acres. I have one child. I've been growing or gardening for about two and a half years, so I'm still fairly new, but I've really learned a lot in this short amount of time. Um, yeah, uh, these plants have really, really helped me a lot overcome a lot of anxiety and depression, and I went through postpartum depression and just a lot of general life haste, so I am super in love with it, and I'm really excited to share it with everybody listening. Nice, nice. I know you from, I think I found you on Instagram first. You have a pretty big Instagram page. Do a lot of skits, like funny skits. I like that. It was really uh, definitely entertaining. So let's get into outdoor growing. The first question I have is when you are outdoor growing, how do you determine like a good spot to plant your plants? Um, well, I think first things first, when I, when I first started, I really need to know what you're working with. Like in Oklahoma, we have a lot of red clay or like red dirt and clay mixture and not a lot of like abundance in the nutrient department. Um, so with that being said, I think the first thing you need to do is get your hand in the dirt, in the soil where you think you're going to be growing and, and feel it out. Look for everything that you need to be looking for, richness, the color, how wet is it already, if it's dry, if it's rock solid. Um, you've got to assess that situation. But... You also need to look at like how much sunlight you're going to get in that particular area in, in like shade. Um, our plants are like sun prominent plants. They need the most sun that they can get. Um, so yeah, I, I just really feel around and I check out my what my daylight's like in the middle of summer and every stage spring, summer. And um, yeah, that's really it. Really soil and sunlight is going to be <laughs> your two best friends. <laughs> so I know you grow medicinal plants just like me, but you also grow some other type of plants. So what do you typically like to grow outdoors? Well, we're working on like food forests. So we have a lot of fruit trees and we, um, we ordered those in as cuttings and we planted them. So I think we're going on year three for those. And, um, our Carolina peach tree just went crazy last year. It was such a beautiful sight. We're not into fruiting yet, but I'm hoping this season will bring fruit, bountiful fruits. And um, so I really enjoy watching the trees grow. And they operate kind of like our medicinal plants. Like you still have to prune them and you can train them to like 
if you don't want your trees to be super tall to climb a ladder, you can hang weights on their branches and train them down so it's easier for picking and you take off the dead leaf. So I really like the trees, but I also really like comfrey and that chef's kiss of a plant. It is so wonderful. You can you can um, chop and drop it and let it replenish the soil. It has a ton of NPK and even trace um, nutrients in it. Or you can take that and you can put it in a bunch of water and you can make comfrey tea. And this is the coolest part. You can grow your own fertilizer to grow your own food. And I think that is so rad. And uh, yeah, I think comfrey is probably my, my favorite. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, do you grow just in the ground or do you grow in containers or do you have like a raised bed? How do you do it? So <clears throat> last year... I think it was last year. It might have been the year before. We killed off, oh, I'm so bad with measurements, a ton of our front yard grass. It's Johnson grass. We killed it off with cardboard, and we basically tried the lasagna method, and I'm sure you probably know what that is, but if anybody doesn't, it's where you're stacking carbon and greens on top of each other, and you're not tilling into the ground. So you're just basically creating this really beautiful, like, I have compost, composted area to where you can plant directly in instead of just digging into the actual ground. And uh, we did that. So that's where I liked to plant last season. I also did have, I think it was like a 10 gallon air bottom bag outside and that was a huge mistake. <laughs> that thing is extremely porous. So my plants dried out almost instantly. And, uh, it's really not my cup of tea <laughs> I have all this space outside so I'm going to utilize that first if I were to go back into pots it would be used purely for aesthetics <laughs> and I think I'd use like an old barrel container instead of super mesh <laughs> breathable container so yeah into the ground it's better got it now preparing the soil for planting right so i'm not sure like what seasons you are typically growing i assume it gets cold and you don't really grow much in the winter time so like before you plant for the season how do you prepare that soil for planting so uh yeah that's good so like the lasagna method is a really good method to use for preparing your soil but like here, for instance, I have livestock. So I have two horses and I have two cows. I have pigs. We have chicks now, but they used to roam around and just poop everywhere. I know that sounds gross, but it's really good for the lawn. Um, so composting. Composting is huge, whether it be your food scraps or livestock. And if you don't have livestock, I'm sure there are some around. So go ask your neighbors if they want to give if they want to give you free poop. It'll be super worth it. <laughs> so um, composting is huge. And last year we did the lasagna method and we still have that and you don't have to redo that every year, which I think is brilliant. It just stays and you can build on top of that as you go. However, we are moving things to the back. So this year we have our compost. It's been cooking for two seasons now. Just keep adding to it and turning it but this year we've already got it ready we actually have six garden rows out back we did a roto till the top layer and we brought our compost over and put it on top so that all of the nutrients can kind of set and it's rained a handful of times already since doing that and um, i think that's a really beneficial way to prepare your soils cool so uh, another thing that people often do is cover crops sometimes people do it before they do planting or some people do cover crops along with their plants do you do cover crops at all or, or no um i didn't do many cover crops last year actually didn't learn about cover crops until last year so i was kind of just free winging it minus like well, well yep we'll get into that i'm sure but our biggest cover crop here is nitrogen. We we just kind of let a ton of, or I'm sorry, of clover. We let a ton of clover, white clover seed, just all over the farm. So now we have clover popping up everywhere. And wouldn't you know it, it's in places that really, really need help, like super need help. But cover crop, 
or clover is the only cover crop that I really utilized besides comfrey. And comfrey can also be used as a cover crop because it has such a wide span of its leaves and it'll cover a ton of distance if you plant it accordingly and where you need it. So I think that those two are really the only things we utilized last year. Okay, and then another thing that kind of goes hand in hand with cover crops, a lot of people will do a mulch layer. Do you do any like wood chips, a barley straw, or any type of mulch? Yeah, so um, we have a ton of excess hay from our livestock. We have grass haze and we have alfalfa. And I know a lot of people use like the alfalfa meals, which is super beneficial for your soils. It's so, so great for your plants. But even just in whole form alfalfa, um, that's been used in the lasagna method and it, it is the most top layer. But um, besides that, we also contacted our local electrical company and they do have to trim down a lot of trees to get to their power lines and they always want a place to dump. So we had them haul their giant <laughs> truckload over to our house and just dump it. And then we took it and we spread it across the lasagna garden. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's really super wonderful for water retention. I think that's, obviously there is nutrients that you can get from these, these um, mulch layers, but water retention is really big. Like We get so hot and dry out here in Oklahoma in the first part of like spring and summer and then it's just humid but it has been really helpful for watering because we're all human and we don't all water every day <laughs> yeah it sounds like it could be beneficial for you yeah i was going to ask you what fertilizer you use and how you go about feedings but it sounds like from everything you've explained so far that you have like a closed loop operation going there where you're just basically using your own inputs from your land so you're not buying any like synthetic fertilizers or going out buying any or organic fertilizers or anything is that right yeah this is a great question so i was like oh my god what am i going to do to feed all of these plants outside <laughs> and well it turns out when you have a perfect environment you don't have to and all of your nutrients your macro and your micronutrients are already in these composted materials and manures and already in some great soil but we ran the clover last year, and I know that put a lot of inputs into our soils too. So no, I haven't had to use any fertilizers, no synthetics outside. I'm a big go green advocate. Um, I do, for the record, use synthetics indoors because I like I like to do it all. <laughs> um, but no, the only thing we did was try out the comfrey tea last year, and it was amazing. Plants just went absolutely bonkers over it. I do want to just add in, if you are going to try out a comfrey tea, it can get a little bit hot. You need to dilute that to like 15 to 1 is a good ratio. And um, I wouldn't recommend using it on seedlings. So just beware of that. Yeah. So not much food. <laughs> Keep it pretty easy there. Now, some people add in like sugars, like molasses or honey. And do you do any of that? And also microbial inoculants. Like I know you've got plenty of diverse microbes in your backyard, but do you buy any micro products and, and use them outdoors or, or no? I've only used micro, micro product, microbe, microbe <laughs> products indoors. Like Dynomyco is like a really popular one. And I mean, I've seen it do some wondrous things to the root zone, like absolutely wild, but no, not outdoors. Um, we're really big on sustainability and like um, we're working on regenerative farming and those things kind of just like really go hand in hand, but also part of like being sustainable is not spending your money and that really goes into it. So no, and I figured with all of the fruit trees and the bigger trees, because we're surrounded by a pretty decent little forest out here in Oklahoma, that there was plenty of <laughs> mycorrhizae and all of that in the ground already. So I haven't really found a need to add into it yet. Um, but as far as like your molasses, your molasses, I'm super not opposed to that as like teas, like boosts. Um, so that may be something I would like to try in the future. I, I actually like looked up like, how do you make molasses? <laughs> Can I do that at home? <laughs> no. 
I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people do commonly use them in you know compost teas as a food source. Have you done any compost teas and, and use them outdoors or or no? I haven't really. I just I haven't had the need to like. Last year, last season, I had 11-foot Christmas trees, like, uh, and they flourished, and um, I just, I, I, I didn't find a need to yet, but it may be, it may, it may this year. That makes sense. So growing outdoors is, there's a lot of differences between growing indoors and outdoors. One of the things that you're more at risk for outdoors is pests. You know, they're all over the place. It's a whole different battlefield. What do you typically do to prevent pests? I want to laugh at prevent. <laughs> I, have <laughs> lear- <laughs> I have learned to be more proactive than reactive, especially outside. Um, and Oklahoma has literally every pest you could possibly think of. So last year, I wasn't really great at preventing. I was more reactive and I would spray. Um, last year I tried out Crop Defender by Petra Tools and it did okay. It was really light application and it seemed to do like the trick but the thing with that is like you really had to keep applying that to, to notice a difference. And um, <clears throat> something that I would really like to advocate is like make sure that your soils are extremely healthy and your plants are extremely healthy when you're growing outside that's going to give them the best chance at survival to use their natural defenses Um, but something that i will be utilizing this year is um, like with companion planting so like there's tons of plants like Rosemary and mint are really at the top of my list because they'll actually just deter and repel plants, or I'm sorry, pests. They, they don't like the smell. It's too stinky. And lavender is also in that category. And then you also have like companion plants like marigolds, and they'll actually like lure in the pests and keep them, well, maybe probably not all of them, but keep them more interested in them versus the medicinal plants. And I think that is just so wonderful. And A, we get to avoid spraying anything on our our crops, but especially when we get into flower, that's always been extremely scary to me. (laughs) Like, ah, I don't want to spray anything on them. And then you you run into to boitrous and chemicals that you could potentially be be inhaling. And like, we don't want that. We don't want that outside at all. So I think utilizing companion plants will be my best route this year for sure that's something i'm gonna have to step my game up uh my outdoor garden i just have a small i mean i'm in las vegas and our backyards are so tiny and i just have a two foot by ten foot bed raised bed and so um usually i grow some lettuce bok choy kale peppers i've got some melons but i don't have any companion plants out there so really think i'm gonna step it up this year have some rosemary and lavender and maybe a few other things in there as well to help on that avenue to help deter pests. I had aphids one year, which was a freaking nightmare. Uh, I was so uh, like heartbreak seeing those things just all over your plants. And uh, yeah, so it'd be good to not deal with that in the future. I think it's fantastic that you're still utilizing the the space that you have, even if it is small. There's so many people I th- I've run into like I don't have this space. Oh, but you do. You can do anything. Like get yourself window herbs or or do what you're doing just a little raised bed box outside start small and it'll progress i promise (laughs) but you can you can utilize all your spaces you just have to want to yeah i mean i'm even trying to cram in a compost pile on my outdoor but like i have my whole yard is basically rock you know it's just it's not moist i'm in the desert you know so it's like there's no earthworms out here at least in my backyard is just so dry but I'm trying to make space i'm gonna rake some of those rocks away and then and then start composting out back because that's another important part of kind of outdoor growing closed loop operations all that stuff which you had mentioned that you do compost it's extremely beneficial it's good for your plants and it's good for the environment I mean, if you can take all of those food scraps instead of throwing them away and reutilize them, you're doing your part. You're helping so much more than you think you are. So, good. That's exciting stuff. 
Yeah, I do want to get into composting a little bit deeper, but first I want to stick on the topic of pests for a minute. Have you had any major pest infestations that you can talk about? If so, like how did you battle them? It's a battle I lost. (laughs) Just (laughs) going to be straight up. Um, Caterpillars were the demise of my 11-foot Christmas trees last year. Um, I, I couldn't really battle them because I, they were super pronounced during flower, which is the stage that they really like. And what they'll do is they'll go into your plants and, of course, eat the, the foliage, but they'll also poop <laughs> in the buds. And a lot of growers don't realize that's happened until they're at harvest and the buds will literally just fall apart. But that'll also cause bud rot, ultimately. So I'm really health conscious. So as soon as I started seeing the bugs and even like one portion of bud rot, I kind of was like, this is probably going to be it for me. I'm not going to smoke this. But I, I wanted to see. And with the humidity and those caterpillars and everything else that was out there, I, I just chopped them and I got rid of them. It, it wasn't worth it to me to even potentially smoke something hazardous. <laughs> so I just got rid of them. But I am really super open to um, whatever IPM regimens that people are doing in flower. I haven't really found a whole lot of information. You know, there's only, there's so much more information now than there even was just a few years ago. But I'm really open to suggestions for the outdoor grows because that really totally kicked me in the behind last year. Yeah, I haven't come across caterpillars, but I've heard about them being a nightmare. I was going to ask you if if you knew of a way to get rid of them, like if if there's a particular spray or if there's any of those companion plants that you use that deter them or what. Yeah, I'm sure that companion plants will come in super handy, and I can almost guarantee that they'll be attracted to things like the marigolds, but... I've also been told to use capsaicin, a capsaicin mixture with water, and that will just absolutely annihilate them, uh, them and many other pests. But I also want to add, if you are going to do that, do it downwind and cover your eyes. <laughs> Be very careful. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that, that the capsaicin will just like basically dry them out, suffocate them in their toast. and. Um, Yeah, that's all fine and dandy, but then what happens when you get to flour? I don't want to smoke spicy. (laughs) You know, I have so many questions about flour. So what other problems do you come across when growing outdoors? Anything else come to mind for you? Yeah, sure. Uh, Humidity. Humidity is a beast within itself, especially out here in Oklahoma. We literally sit in like 75 to 90 percent humidity when we get into summer. (laughs) And it's awful because when you get into late summer, you're showing signs of flower and you're kind of at a standpoint. So some of the things that I could recommend to kind of like counter humidity is Go outside right as the sun is rising and shake off any morning dew in your plant so it doesn't have time to sit there and absorb, especially, again, in flower. Um, And, I mean, how do you battle outdoor moisture? (laughs) Be really careful when you are using IPM. Like, make sure you're, you're really trying to utilize that in vegetative state. And also be really careful when you're watering. So, like, don't just go out there spraying your whole plant down trying to cool it off cool it off because that will just absolutely backfire. Make sure you're watering at the base and really trying to to avoid the foliage if you can, you know. Um, I don't think it would be crazy to actually train my plants this season and get them at maybe a little bit shorter height for me. I'm five foot two, eleven foot plants. That was a challenge last year. But like training them down and even using like cattle panel and um, uh, shade cloth because it'll still allow the sun to penetrate, just take off like a few percentages of the UV. Um, And even getting maybe like an industrial fan outside and just giving them some extra airflow. I think that could really super be beneficial. It's like a temporary greenhouse cloth house. I'm curious for those 11 foot plants. I mean, that's massive. What was your yield for that? Did you measure it? 
No, because I had to chop them down. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So you didn't actually get any of them to harvest? Uh, no, I did not want to risk it, and it was absolutely dead. Yeah, I'm hanging my head. <laughs> it was it was really seriously sad. I hope you have better luck this year on that avenue. Have you had any outdoor harvests? I was going to ask you about, like, you know, there's a lot of controversy about, a lot of debate about indoor versus outdoor and the flavor profile. I was wonder if you had an opinion on uh, if you feel like the outdoor sun grown results in a better terpene profile, better flavor compared to indoor or not. Um, I, I, it's so hard to say because <laughs> we've grown some really, really fire indoor product, like things that straight up smell like fruit, like, like not flower fruit. <laughs> and it just absolutely blows my brain, like incredible and outside i know you can't beat the sun but there's so many other factors that go into it like environmental like what are you around what kind of scents is this plant going to pick up how's the pollution in your area like i think it all plays a part in 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 sticking to these aromatic oils you know like i'm thinking varies i think the sun is a, a really powerful and beautiful tool but I think that we've come really far in replicating that and such a cleaner environment indoors. So I don't know. I'm pretty 50-50 on that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm the same way. I mean, I've grown a lot of fire indoor. I certainly consumed a lot of outdoor as well over the years, but I don't personally grow medicinal plants outdoors so at least right now i don't i'm not able to and my state it doesn't allow it unfortunately hopefully that'll change sometime in the future but as of right now i can't i would love to grow some medicinal plants outside but yeah i'm not gonna uh pick and choose indoor versus outdoor <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a it's a hard hard question and we know so many people that rock both of them so it's like <laughs> i don't want to say who's better um I, I thought Vegas, is it Vegas Rec? You just can't grow? Yeah, Vegas is Rec. It's uh, basically you have to, if you're over 25 miles away from a dispensary, then you can grow, home grow up to six plants. Now, if you have a medical card, that's when you're able to grow up to 12 plants. As long as a cultivar that you need for your medical condition isn't available in the local dispensary. So that's kind of the, the loophole that they have here. And I'm, I'm fairly sure that there's no outdoor growing. Like, it's not supposed to be outdoors at all. Like, of course, not visible and so on and so forth. Our backyards are so small. Like I mentioned that neighbors can easily just look over and see your entire backyard. So in most places, very rare to find a private backyard unless you're a millionaire and you've got... You've got tons of money to buy a huge, you know, private land in the backyard and stuff like that. But uh, that's crazy. They really, really bubbled that around dispensaries and their profits. That's crazy. They want money. They want the money. They want the tax well, revenue, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not that crazy. Sucks. <laughs> right. So uh, I do want to get deeper into plant training. I know you kind of touched upon it. You said you wished you did more plant training. What do you typically do for plant training when you grow outdoors? Just the same, like. I keep my my plants really clean. Um, at first, I was pretty scared to, like, remove any foliage or any branches just because that's an open wound in your plant, giving pests literally front gate access <laughs> to inside your plants. But um, I had an aloe plant outside, so anytime I pruned or defoliated or, or anything, I would always rub um, aloe on those open wounds and kind of like help it heal up but also creates a barrier between the pests and the plant and it it seemed to work out really well I never had any like um you will probably know there's a pest that'll like burrow itself is it called a burrow <laughs> inside your plant stem and like get into your plant and absolutely destroy it so i was like super scared of that so having that was great and i didn't really do much training outdoors i really wanted to see a medicinal plant in its full state because i haven't gotten to in in first hand i've seen it on tv <laughs> and on on the youtubes um but yeah i didn't really train i usually lsd and i do i have done trellis training or trellis net indoors but I just wanted to see really, really giant plants, so I got what I got. <laughs> um, this year, like I said, I, I would really like to utilize more training to keep them, you know, closer to height. 
just easily touchable. I had to lug a gigantic ladder around outside, and it was fun being up there, but really just big old pain. Um, so probably some LST, probably do some stakes, um, ground stakes, and have places to tie them off to. It's the same old, same old as indoors, just bigger. <laughs> Sweet. I want to circle back to composting. Now, I myself have a vermicompost bin, so I've been utilizing, uh, I have a small bin indoor in my garage. I got some worms in there, and I, you know, I started out with the half cocoa, half paper shreds in there. And food scraps. So I'm putting the greens in there, banana peels, coffee grounds. But I want to learn more about like how you do it. Now you mentioned the lasagna method. Is that kind of the only way you go about the composting, or do you have like piles and add in food scraps, or, or what do you typically do? Yeah, um, the lasagna gardening method can act as a compost pile. You can really just go out there and throw your food scraps. Um, with that, if you're in an environment that have like deer and raccoons and all those little critters, like you're definitely going to want to try and bury that as far down as you can, even if you're just tossing it out there. Just a little tip, but we started our compost pile. I, I believe, I've had my horse for about two and a half years now. So when he came, we really, really got into it because we had a ton of excess manure. And so we put... Um, the uh, pallets, like moving pallets around, and we made like just two little squares. <laughs> two <laughs> little squares. <laughs> two, two little, little squares, bays, right I guess, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. Two little bays. So we just started adding his manure, and of course, like there's a bunch of um, like dirt and all of the natural elements, but like also the straws and the hay, two different kinds of hay. So we have a prairie hay and we have an alfalfa hay and grass clippings and leaves and food and anything that we could really utilize we threw in there and um, definitely got hot <laughs> definitely got hot enough to break down the scary bacteria. <laughs> um, and then you just rotate it and I know people like you can probe it and temp like take your temperatures on it we didn't get that scientific okay you just really winging it out here um, but yeah, it's so crazy. So we took that three-year compost and we moved it to our six rows at the back to top those guys off. But just after turning it and having it for so long, this stuff breaks down into the richest. You'd think it smelled terrible, but it smells so, so good, so rich and like so much like dirt. I know that sounds funny, but from going from manure to dirt, it's just such a a radical process like you can physically hold this and I think we can all do it now just tell when like that soil is super rich and it's ready to be planted in versus crumbly crusty or too tight and it, it, it just not plentiful so like being able to see the difference was seriously um not shocking because I knew it was coming but it's like okay yes we're doing the right thing you know it was validating and uh, yeah, it's so much simpler than than I think the internet and some people even try to make it. It sounds really complex on the internet. You have to have all of these elements and you have to probe it. And you have to turn it a thousand times and you have to keep it moist to keep everything alive. <laughs> it, 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 it's not as, not as complex as it seems online. So that's our process. It's really easy. And um, if we're not using our food scraps for our compost, we feed it to our livestock, mostly our pigs. They just go crazy for bucket feed. <laughs> and then they do the whole process, and then they turn that into compost themselves, and they push it into our, our grass that they're on. And, yeah, fun stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Closed loop operation. I mean, that's kind of a lot of people's goal is to kind of get to that, to where they're using their compost as fertilizer really. And, um, rewarding, I guess is probably the word that I would use for when you successfully compost something, because I, I had that feeling before. I, I'll never forget the first time where I dug into my vermicompost bin, like probably about six months after eight months after I started it. And just kind of digging down, just seeing that uh, you know black gold a lot of people refer it to, where it's just so good. And uh, being able to take that and then top dress my plants and then 
yeah, not have to worry about adding any, any additional fertilizers on top of that. But yeah, it's pretty cool. And I, I totally agree with you where it's not as hard as people make it out to be on the internet. It could really be simple if you take the simple approach. So yeah, well said there. I think everybody wants to sound like a little bit more scientific, a little bit more exaggerated, maybe a little bit smarter than they might be. That sounds mean, but I promise it's not. But they try, they want to make it complex, so they have, like, this valuable information, you know, instead of just, like, here you go, this is how you do it. <laughs> it's real pretty easy. Absolutely. So do you have any other advice that you want to talk about in this podcast episode or uh, maybe any maybe some advice for beginners that are kind of just starting outdoor growing? Yeah. Um, so learn your zones, like your gardening zones. That's super important for outside. You need to know when you're going to run into your your last frost date and then your first frost date so you know when to start and when you need to harvest by. Um, and, and it's more important for your start <laughs> when you're starting seedlings because you do not want those to get frozen at all. Um, if you're, you're almost ready harvest plants freeze once they'll be okay believe it or not <laughs> um and learn your pests and what you have in your environment already you need to learn um you know of course like how much sunlight you're getting in the specific area that you're looking to grow and be careful when you're picking strains like if you're in a place like me like sativa dominant strains do much better than indicas because they're short squat tight and that is a really good way to get boisterous or bud rot because there's just not a lot of airflow in there um if you can have your soils tested but it's not 100 percent necessary like put your hands in it feel around um, again use your resources so if you don't have manure and you want to look into that side of composting hunt down a barn with boarding horses, go to your local farmer, ask your neighbor that has goats and rabbits because all of that is super beneficial. And chickens, if they can collect chicken poop for you, that's wonderful. <laughs> um, and start a compost pile outside or start a compost bin indoors and utilize it. Please do it. You can do it. and It's fun. And, um, yeah, I think just keep it simple and just go do it. <laughs> it will all be okay. That's some really good advice. So let's wrap things up. Tell the listeners how they can find you. And uh, is there anything you have upcoming in the future that you want to talk about? Um, you can find me on Instagram at Barely Growing. It's B-A-R-E-L-E-E -E -E dot Growing. And on YouTube. And I'm also over on Twitter. Twitter allows us to share our plants now. So <laughs> I'll be over there too. Um yeah, I think we will be making some not just medicinal plant content for YouTube and Instagram, but we'll also bringing the homesteading content to primarily YouTube and more into Instagram to show how both of these worlds collide, and they collide super, super well. So that is something that I'm really looking forward to, and I hope that you guys are as well. Awesome. Well, I know I will definitely be following you on your journey and I'll have a link to Cassie's Instagram down in the YouTube description section below so you can easily get to it. Give her a follow and uh, hit that like button if you haven't already and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode and I'd love for you to tune into future episodes. Well, Cassie, this has been a fun chat. Appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for coming on and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for having me and I absolutely will. All right, peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.